Digit was moving totes of Spanx women's wear products during the peak holiday shipping season. They also recently brought in veteran technology leader Peggy Johnson as CEO and promoted Melanie Wise to the expanded role of Chief Product Officer. We have both Peggy and Melanie here today to talk about what's next for Agility and Digit. We'll also be joined by Dr. Scott Walter, a two-time robotics company founder, in the second half of the interview. Gotcha. Okay. Let me bring in Dr. Scott Walter to the conversation. He is a two-time robotics company founder. He and I have been interviewing quite a number of the human robot executives and CEOs. And then, um, you know, we need to find out more about your battery life and your hands and so forth. So, Scott, welcome. Hello, Melanie. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, boy, I have all sorts of questions that from, from listening in. And I think the first thing I want to do is, is, uh, is a, um, address sort of what Peggy was talking about, because it's come up a few times that the, the first time I saw um, Digit was when it was um, a trade show a little over a year ago. And it was like the first time a humanoid bot was really shown doing real work publicly. And then you did it again, and you're still like the only one to really do it. Others have maybe unveiled the bot or something like that, but not really shown it doing anything good. And Herbert also mentioned the term useful work earlier. And, and a lot of people mention that term. And what does useful work really mean? And I decided to sort of dis, uh, define it one time uh, as, as pretty much being able to do the same task that a human is already currently doing, be able to do it with the same reliability, the same repeatability, accuracy, cycle time, for the same kind of duration, and then most importantly, for the same cost. So Peggy, you, you've talked about the ROI as, as being there, of being equivalent to the human labor, because you almost asked the question I had. So it sounds like you really are doing useful work. And the first example, of course, was uh, GXO with the spandex. So it's like, okay, it was doing real work. I, we can agree with that, it's doing real work. Something was getting done. The question was it to the level that it was useful in that they could say, yes, it makes sense to actually purchase um, or to use a humanoid bot to do this. Yeah, and, and th that's exactly where we were at with them over the holidays. They needed uh, more labor and obviously things get peaky at the holidays and you need to fill in with humans. They have the same issue as everybody else in the logistics arena does. We can't get enough humans to take these jobs. And so they agreed to allow us to come in and actually take shifts during the holiday season. Um, that worked out very well for them. Uh, we continue to have conversations with them, but that's the sort of thing that we're focused on. What can we do that delivers you value right now. And that's why we're focused on those areas. We're, you know, we're not as focused on making coffee or doing backflips. <laughs> we're focused on doing real work. That's where the problem is. That's what we're trying to solve. Yeah, so that's what it sounds like. So they were able to afford it when they were sort of in that peak labor demand area. Uh, can they still afford it, let's say, in the off season when, okay, so uh, I'm seeing Melanie now. So, so basically, you really, really are doing useful work and that anyone that has a solution or let's say has a problem right now, they should be seriously considering using a humanoid bot to do it. Now, the other question I have here for, for Melanie is that you come from the AMR world. So you know all about robots with wheels. So the obvious question is, wait a minute, why legs? Why not wheels? Yeah, yeah. Everyone asks me that after spending most of a decade working on AMRs. Why did you suddenly uh, lose faith and go to legs? And it's not that I lost faith. Um, it's that I, I, I found over the last 10 years that AMRs are very good at specific types of problems. And there are serious limitations to AMRs when you start trying to do more complex tasks. Um, a lot of those, a lot of those limitations come around stability. So much of much of AMR's success relies around being able to be in relatively tight spaces with people and navigate around them and get to endpoints and deliver goods or be loaded by people with goods. That's a very common use case. But when you start trying to put appliances on AMRs to reach into shelving and to grab things, robots, AMRs become pretty tippy because many of them don't have really great low center of gravity. And in order to get that better center of gravity to lower it to the ground, things like that, you have to either make the footprint a lot bigger. And in the warehouse, space is king. Every square foot that you take up, uh, you're, you're spending thousands of dollars uh, from an operator perspective. 
And so they don't want to make the aisles wider and things like that. And so when you start trying to lift a 16 kilogram tote, one meter out from a tiny AMR, it falls over. And so there's lots of situations in the warehouse where uh, customers really just want to move material from shelving units to other locations. And there aren't great solutions for wheeled mobile robots that are not dynamically stable to grab these very heavy totes at long distances in deep recessed shelving and bring them to different locations. And so, you know, a lot of what I saw with the mobile manipulation space, specifically bipedal dynamically stable robots, is it solves many of those problems. Obviously there's new problems that come along with that, like I said, safety, but I have a deep background in safety. I looked at Digit, there's some very particular things about the robot that make it a great candidate for collaborative safety and being a groundbreaking breaking robot in that in that sense. And so I was excited to join Agility and help them commercialize the technology because I really saw it as the next stage of opportunity for uh, autonomous mobile robots in in facilities. And you know what's even funnier is many of the many of the applications that we're getting deployed in today digit is the amr's best friend and it to me it's very satisfying because i spent such a long time in the amr market and to see the next robot that i'm working on being a buddy to the last robot i worked on is super exciting Yeah, I, I kind of agree that the AMR makes sense when you have sort of the medium haul to, to long haul kind of movement from one side of the factory to another. You would never, you wouldn't even have a human doing that. So, but when you get to the end, you know, it's it's people talk about the last mile problem. It's literally like the last foot problem <laughs> in that case. And either, yeah, you 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 stick a, an arm on there, which you're having going back and forth all the time. That's not really being used except at the endpoints or like. Just put the robots at the endpoints, and not only just sticking a robot, but a deployable robot. So when it's not needed at that endpoint right now, it can do something else and come back to it. So that, that sort of does make sense. Now, um, you talked a little bit earlier about ARC. And so I've, I've got a question for, for that and, and the integration you have there. So uh, typically like um, in a lot of packaging situations, you might have like a pick to light where the human is just going up there and looking exactly what they're supposed to do. Now is Digit able, does it do pick the light or does it not need that because it's actually tied into the system and it knows what to do next? Yeah, it wouldn't need to, to do pick to light because basically what pick to light is doing is it's saying light up slot A. And so it knows that you have to go to slot A. And so it just transmits slot A directly to digit. And so it actually pick the light is like the, the digits best friend in some ways, because the, the, the package, the packet, you know, the, that's transmitted from the WMS is perfectly formed for transmitting it to a robot. And so that's one of the really great things about all of the infrastructure that's been built for humans, whether it's uh, voice uh, text, it's voice pick to voice or pick to light or pick to X, you know, uh, many of those systems are well architected for being transformed to basically direct robots uh, just as well as it directs people. So it's that's super awesome in general. Okay, yeah, well, uh, Peggy, I, I've got a, a question for you now is I, I noticed that the last thing you did before you joined Agility was that you ran the Tokyo Marathon. Oh. So are you looking forward to someday running a marathon with Digit? <laughs> I, I, I've talked about this. I think Digit would beat me probably. Uh, the predecessor, Cassie was uh, that um, Jonathan Hurst, our founder, did worked on at Oregon State uh, is a very fast runner, and I am not a very fast runner, <laughs> so I don't know that I can win any any uh, race with Digit. In it. But, but still, it's a, it's an endurance event. That twenty six miles is pretty <laughs> long. I it'd probably have to start with like a five k and then maybe a ten k or something like that. But yeah, maybe somewhere in there. Um, Digit right. has a battery, and I don't. <laughs> I, Scott, I thought you were going to refer to her work at Magic Leap and maybe Microsoft. I mean, like the Magic Leap thing. I mean, uh, there's, you know, we're talking about virtual environments. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At I mean, least ask questions about that. There. Yeah, <laughs> right. there, there could be a tie-in uh, okay. there because 
uh, you know, certainly, you know, telerobotic operation and stuff like that is, uh, is there a role kind of for the uh, magic leap as being a part of that or using a technology similar to that? Definitely there's similar similarities in technologies with things like computer vision and perception. Um, they, they were very deep on that in the magic leap headset. So there's a lot of crossover in those sorts of technologies as, uh, as digit learns to understand its environment and move to the right box or location uh, to do its next task. There's a lot of, there's actually quite a bit of synergy there. Yeah. And, uh, and then, then I have like, you know, some, some questions I always ask, uh, like asking about the kinematics of the bot. And I noticed that uh, there's been a little bit of an evolution to the arms that you are using in, in uh, Digit. And that in the first case, you had like um, a four axis arm and the shoulder was designed a particular way. And then when you went through the seven axis, I assumed the shoulder was the same and it completely changed it. And it actually was a bit disappointed because I loved that shoulder design. And so Melanie, can you, can you talk to me about that and why you decided to go what I guess you'd say more traditionally off pitch roll kind of shoulder versus what you had before? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it had to do with the tasks that we wanted to take on and the manipulation workspace that we wanted to achieve, right? Like when you look at the when you look at the manipulation workspace that we want to work in long term, it requires us to be able to get into tight spaces, reach into things. And that requires us to have more of a 313 kind of manipulation joint space architecture, which gives us a more complete volumetric workspace where we can get to any point in space with a lot of flexibility, right? So that if we wanted to do, say, machine tending down the road, which is definitely one of the things that we're looking at. Um, that requires us to reach into a closed enclosed space like a CNC machine. And so we have to be able to reach around corners. Um, and you even see that now with, with, say, like fixed shelving. If the shelving is near a wall, we need to be able to either have our elbow really down when grabbing or really up when grabbing so that we're not colliding with the wall. And so that's kind of more what's driving us towards that architecture not any particular bias for uh the the aesthetic of the robot or or our particular predilection with some joint configuration it's really about the brass tacks of practical robotics let's call it so you said that you have tens of robots now hundreds and then thousands in the future when will you feel like your design locked Hmm. So a lot of our design lock is driving towards full collaborative safety. That's when I think we'll call design lock. So right now, um, we right now deploy in work cells um, as part of our as part of our safety strategy because the most of the prevailing standards are relatively silent on dynamically stable humanoids. Uh, so the prevailing standard is ANSI RA R1508 which basically governs AMRs and mobile manipulation robots. And the, the standard is a little bit silent on what happens when dynamically stable robots fall um, due to tripping or power loss. And so we're still working through that, um, but we believe that we will have a fully collaborative robot, like I said, in the next two to three years. And when we achieve that, that's when I think I will have the confidence mm -hmm. to say, that we are completely design locked. 